To become a full-time engineer that also creates content and trains jiu-jitsu, there's a bunch of habits and skills that I've had to build over time. Every skill I acquired today came out of an L that I've faced in the past. For example, you wanna know a secret? In my third year, I almost dropped out of engineering. Wait, what? That was almost four years ago when I was 20. I've learned a lot since then, which leads me to the first tip of the video. Understand that you don't have to do well in school, you just need to do well relative to everyone else. You got an 88%, but the class average was 95%. That's really not good, terrible actually. But you got a 69% and the class average was 56%. That's amazing. Unfortunately, that's just how our school system works and we need to follow it and abide by it in order to succeed to the system. Early on in university, I didn't understand this, which made me want to quit. I was so used to 90s and 100s in high school, so when I was getting 70s in university, I was just confused. If you ever had a class or a course you didn't like, most probably you didn't hate the subject, but you hated the teacher. Because a good teacher can make any subject or class or course very interesting and engaging, no matter how boring or dull that course may be. I know this because I had a material science professor in my first year of engineering that made me absolutely fall in love with that course. And keep in mind, material science isn't the most interesting course out there. But he somehow made it really fun and engaging to the point where I even considered specializing in a materials engineering discipline. Next, I strongly believe in finessing. Realize that every system around you has been built by someone that's no better or smarter than you. So when you're trying to achieve something, you need to understand the system you're working within and cleverly finesse it. Let me give you an example. When I was in high school applying to university, I knew how important grades were. I wanted to get accepted into engineering at the University of Waterloo and to have an 80% chance of being accepted, you need to get at least a 95% grade point average. Anything lower than 95% greatly reduce your chances of getting accepted. At least that was what's going on back then. I was never one of those genius smart kids in school. You know who I'm talking about. So in addition to studying, I also studied every single teacher at my school, how they teach, how they grade, etc. Based on this data, I created a list of teachers that I wanted. For example, one calculus teacher at my high school would take off 0.25 marks for every mistake you made, whereas other teachers would take off one full mark. So since every percentage counts, that makes a huge difference. For example, my school would give me a schedule that looks like this, where I have calculus first period, but I would want to switch it to third period since the better teacher is teaching at that time. So I'd finesse the system by taking a random course that's only available first period, which would force them to move my calculus to third period. Then after I get what I want, I could just drop that class. But you may be wondering, why do you go through all this? Why don't you just ask the person in charge of your schedule to move your calculus from first to third period? The short answer is most of them are mean and they say, we're not authorized to make that change. So I just finesse it to get what I want. So whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, you need to understand the system that you're working within really, really well and finesse it while obviously staying legal. Figure out the people involved, the rules of the game, and develop your own strategy for finesse. Next, when you have a job or an internship, you're going to get a ton of projects and it's important to keep track of all the projects you're working on. Have some pictures of it and documents that allow you to track your progress within that project. That way, when you're done with your internship or your job, you can look back at all of your past experiences, put it on your resume, and then share it in future job interviews. You'll be surprised on how easily you'll forget the projects you worked on like three months ago. Tracking your projects also helps a lot when you're asking for a raise or promotion at work. Moving on, when you're doing a job, especially if you're new or one of the younger members on the team, you may feel shy to talk or explain your view or maybe you're just confused. I know it's easier said than done and it may be difficult to try, but you should really just put yourself out there, ask questions, explain your point of view and don't be shy. Just speak up and if you mess up, honestly, no one cares as long as you're respectful. And I'm gonna be honest, just between you and me, at work, we have a lot of meetings and most of the time, the people in meetings aren't even paying attention to what you're saying unless their name is explicitly called out. So trust me, you'll be fine. You ever notice that in high school, you'll have classes that start at 8 a.m., you have clubs right after school, you have a part-time job, and a sport that you play consistently. It was a pretty busy schedule, but you managed it well. But when you go to university or college, you have like only one or two classes a day, and you find that you can barely keep up. That's because in university, we tend to have a lack of structure. No one is creating a schedule for you anymore. Yes, you have less class time, but because no one is organizing your schedule for you, it feels like you have less time. Moving on, when you're studying engineering or preparing to become one, it can be confusing. So it's best to follow an engineering roadmap that you know works. An example would be a job hunting roadmap for engineering like this one. 
where in stage one during your first year, you want to apply to internships for tiny, tiny startups. Then stage two, you want to apply to internships for corporate companies in your second and third year. Finally, in stage three, you want to apply to internships for tech companies. That way, you're progressively applying to harder and harder internships as time goes on and your skills improve. To get jobs and be able to follow an engineering roadmap like this, we need to use a trusted and credible job hunting website. That's where Dice.com comes in who are sponsoring this part of the video. When you're looking to start a career in tech, you can just go to their website, type in the job title you want and the location you want to work in. You'll get a long list of jobs and if you think you're qualified, it's free to apply. It's definitely a great resource when you're trying to find startups or corporate companies to work for to complete stage one and stage two of the engineering job hunting roadmap. Sometimes you may even find big tech companies on there depending on availability. What's cool about it is when you're hunting, you can filter by remote options, date posted, type of employment, and whether you want to go through a recruiting company or be directly hired by an engineering company. What I also like is they have both intern and full-time positions ranging from entry level to senior positions. But sometimes having the perfect resume and applying to jobs just isn't enough. You need to expand your network. Dice.com helps with that because they have a career events tab. Here you can find virtual and in-person events that connect you with recruiters and hiring managers looking for people like you and I. All you have to do is register and you're in. I'll have a link to dice.com in the video description. Moving on, sometimes in engineering school, we get lost with confusing equations and really difficult problem sets. And then in the engineering workplace, we may get busy with mind numbing documentation or office politics. That may make you lose touch with engineering and fall out of love with it. When that happens, just remember why you chose to pursue engineering to begin with, to build some pretty cool stuff. Next, whenever you're learning a new topic, it's super important to create mind maps, diagrams, and charts to help you connect all the different concepts you learn together. Do this for all the classes you have in school or even for the new stuff that you're going to be learning in life or at work. For example, this is a mind map I made for a class I took in university and this is another mind map I have for my jiu-jitsu when I first started out. Next, when you get started with an engineering career, you shouldn't just work 9 to 5 and then go home and rot. Engineering shouldn't be the only thing about you. You should explore hobbies and find other ways to make money outside of your engineering job. Get into dropshipping, do private tutoring, invest in stocks, start a business, write a book, etc. That way, in case you lose your job, that's fine because you have other things as part of your identity. Now, I know I just mentioned you shouldn't make engineering your entire life, but there does come moments in your engineering job where you should go above and beyond, and there comes moments when you should just take it easy and chill. If you go above and beyond at certain times when it's really needed, you'll be remembered for that. For example, at the startup I work for, we had a build season this summer where I was working on managing building portions of the robot from scratch. We needed to get the build done by a certain day and we had about a month or two to do so. So I'd work overtime like 12 hour days to get that done. Now if I need to take time off or leave work early for a doctor's appointment or something, it's fine because I'm already trusted that I can get my work done. So don't always go off with work like this, but only do it when it really, really matters so that way you just don't burn out. Moving on, I like to classify most of what I do in my life into three types of fun. Type 1 fun is a classical type of fun. It's fun to do and fun to remember. When you're doing it, you want to keep going and when you're done, you just want to do it again. For example, going on a date with someone you really like, eating your favorite meal or going to a party. Type 2 fun is when you're doing something that isn't very fun in the moment, but it's always fun when you look back on. For example, going skydiving or getting an engineering degree. Looking back at it, those things were actually pretty fun, but would I do it again? Probably not. Type 3 fun are things that aren't fun to do at all and aren't even fun when you look back on it. But it usually makes an incredible story. For example, getting unfairly fired from a job, having your car being stuck and broken down in the middle of nowhere, having a really close encounter with a lion at a zoo in his cage, or filling a course because someone decided to plagiarize your work. They're definitely interesting stories to tell, but it's not something you really want to go through. The reason it's important for me to know the three types of fun is because it allows me to describe what's going on in my life. And if we're able to describe it and understand it, then we feel like we have more control over it. Next, as humans, we just naturally get a huge sense of purpose when we create things. So if I ever feel a lack of fulfillment in my life, it's usually because I haven't created things in a while. So you should definitely try creating art, making music, building things, etc. to get those creative muscles working. Understand that there's beauty in everything, even your dull and boring engineering classes. I started noticing this tip when I came across videos on TikTok of people romanticizing their life working at Subway or working at Cold Stone, the ice cream shop. 
Now, on the surface, they seem like boring or stale jobs, nothing really exciting about them. But they somehow made it seem so fun and engaging. Or another example would be when I used to live in Egypt as a kid, I used to think it was normal or boring or regular, but now I see these Instagram videos romanticizing the Egyptian aesthetic. It just goes to show that whatever it is you're doing, you can always find the beauty in it. Moving on, no one wants to live a life they can't remember. One way to remember your life is to introduce novelty to it. For example, doing internships at multiple companies or working abroad introduces a ton of things into your life, which makes it really hard for your brain to forget. Another way to introduce novelty in your life and make it more memorable is to travel. For example, when I look back at my life this year, I don't remember the time I spent in front of my laptop catting or editing videos. Instead, I remember my trips to LA, Utah, and Vegas in May, my trip to Canada in June, my trip to New York in August, etc. These trips can be pricey, but we're all gonna die anyways, so might as well live a life that you can remember on your deathbed. Damn, that got deep. Anyways, on a lighter note, do what's good for the plot. Every time you're faced with a decision, imagine your life was a movie and you're the main character. If the thing you're about to do or the decision you're about to make would be good for the plot of that movie, then do it. For example, asking your crush out, good for the plot. Taking an internship halfway across the world, good for the plot. Sitting at home and binging Netflix all day, bad for the plot. Watching Tamer Machine on YouTube, good for the plot. Now we're about to go deep for this tip. There is a concept called TMT, which stands for Terror Management Theory. It goes like this, we know death is inevitable. That thought is scary and can give us anxiety. But what helps us get over it is mainly one of two things, religious beliefs and self-esteem. These things make us feel immortal and as if we're part of something bigger than ourselves that will last long after we're gone. This is a defense mechanism that we all have that gives us relief. It's good to keep this in mind because it makes you realize how insignificant some of the problems you have on a day to day are, like getting rejected from a job. Next, maybe you want to ask for a raise at work, ask your crush on a date, or ask your friend for a job. This tip is obvious, but don't ever assume the answer to that question is no, because honestly, with asking, you really have nothing to lose. Remember, terror management theory, your day-to-day -day problems are actually pretty insignificant. Next, whenever you have the means, at least once in your life, you have to host a party. I did this on October 8th for my 24th birthday, and over 50 people showed up, and it was such an incredible feeling. Definitely something you should add to your bucket list, because one of the things that brings us humans joy is spending time with really good people. Speaking of people, in life and work you're going to make a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues and you'll meet a bunch of new people. Some of them will be bad or toxic. When you meet people like that don't associate with them because no one deserves to have bad friends or relationships. We live in a world of almost 8 billion people so you're bound to find friends that care about you and someone that loves you. Tip 23, learn to backflip. It's such a cool thing to know how to do and you can literally learn it in a day. Tip 24, do a practical martial art. Knowing how to fight and basic self-defense can give you so much more confidence. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value. If it did, check out this video where I share 16 tips I wish I knew before becoming an engineering student or check out this video where I share with you a day in my life as an engineer. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Peace!